one week later. Chapter 20. Anaya watched as the helicopter lifted off from the military base on Deadman's Island. Carrying her father and Dr. Weber through the window, Dad gave her a thumbs up. From the field, she waved back with a nervous smile. Strapped to the underside of the helicopter was a torpedo-sized tank of herbicide. Please let this work, Petra said beside her. The helicopter nosed out over the harbor. The water was darkly blanketed by lilies. And I couldn't believe how quickly they'd flourished in the salt water, fouling the air with their stink. A week ago, the harbor had been filled with anchored boats escaping the vines and pit plants. Now only a few remained, slouched low in the water, abandoned and riddled with holes by the acid-coated seeds. Look at all the news helicopters, Seth said. And I counted more than ten, hovering around Stanley Park. Their doors slid back, cameras jetting, surrounded almost entirely by water. The huge city park had been a designated a test site. It was completely overrun with black grass and vines. The fields and forests malignant with pit plants. Dad had said the eastern point was a good place to test their new herbicide for the first time. And now she, along with the rest of the world, was watching and hoping. Barely a week ago, she'd been helping load eight bags of soil onto their rescue helicopter at the eco-reserve. She and Petra and Seth had all managed to keep their true identity secret from the soldiers. She'd swapped her shoes with Petra's slightly bigger ones to hide her claws, and Seth had bundled his feathered arms back inside his hoodie. The moment they'd touched down on Deadman's Island, they'd been summoned before Colonel Pearson and grilled. They told him what had happened on the eco-reserve while hiding details like razor-sharp feathers, tails, and possibly high jumps everything to do with the fact that the three of them were cryptogen hybrids. Four soldiers die, three kids survive, Pearson had said, looking at them so severely that Anaya squirmed inside, and all for some dirt. But when the helicopter crew reported how the canopy of vines had died and collapsed, even the colonel had to admit the soil was very promising. You're tough kids, he said. Good job. Right after that, Dad had been whisked into surgery to have the seed removed from his neck. The very next day, he was up and in the lab helping Dr. Weber, who refused to let her own injuries slow her down. Taking only short breaks to sleep, they'd worked together, first isolating the bacterium in the soil and then trying to culture it for herbicide. Now, it would get its first test. Anaya gazed across the water at the towering groves of black grass on the park's shoreline. Dad's helicopter made several low passes, spraying, then lifted higher to cover the vine-choked treetops. The newscopters drifted and Bob, filming everything. Anaya felt an arm curl around her shoulder and turned to smile at Mum. She wore a pollen mask, like practically everyone else watching on the field. Her eyes were shadowed with fatigue. Her face didn't look as gaunt as it had been when she'd arrived four days ago flying the float plane the military had secured for her. She'd brought Petra's mom and dad with her, as well as several island patients who needed to be transferred to bigger hospitals. How fast will this stuff work, mom asked her. On Cordova, dad said the plants started to die within an hour. She leaned into mom, seeing her get out of that float plane, she'd felt such a complicated tangle of emotions. First, there was love and sheer relief, but it didn't come with the feeling of safety she'd yearned for. She'd been through so much alone and knew too much to feel like mom could solve all her problems and keep her safe. And then there was the absolute dread too, knowing that she would have to tell mom what she was. Luckily it was dad who'd mostly done that part. And afterward, mom had said all the right things and hugged her really tightly. And I knew mom and dad could never think of her exactly the same way again. She just hoped they still loved her as much and could keep loving her no matter what came next. She looked over at Petra, watching the test spray with her own parents. She knew Petra had been worried sick about how to tell her own parents, and Dr. Weber had helped her out. Afterward, when Anaya had asked how it went, Petra had laughed it off by saying her mom had always thought she was half alien anyway, so not much had really changed. She said her father took it harder, but had told her everything was going to be okay. Anaya's eyes drifted over to Seth, at least she and Petra had parents. Seth had no one, except for Carlene Lee, 
who was still on the base as Seth's de facto guardian, but that didn't count. He had to deal with all of this alone. No, Anaya told herself, that isn't true. He had them, Petra and her, and Dr. Weber. Anaya remembered how, after they'd gotten back to the base and finally had some privacy, Dr. Weber had examined Seth's arms. They were so bruised and cut and needed stitches in a few places. She called him a hero and then very tenderly wrapped his feathers back up with clean gauze. A real mother couldn't have done it any differently. Anaya caught Seth's eye now and smiled. Then she checked his sleeves. It had become a habit over the past few days to make sure none of his feathers had cut through, but they were safely concealed inside his layers of clothing. She was terrified of being discovered. She couldn't forget the way Brock and especially Jolie had looked at them and the gun that had been trained on all three of them. Petra's changes were easier to hide hide than Seth's. The skin on her legs was still sloughing, but that was simple enough to conceal. Harder was the tail, which had grown enough to make a small bump in her jeans. Probably no one would notice it, but Petra had started wearing a skirt over leggings just in case. And I glanced down at her own shoes. With some help from Dr. Weber, she'd sawed and filed down her toenails. She wasn't quite ready to call them claws yet. Surprisingly, she'd felt sad cutting them, like a part of her was being taken away. But they'd started to grow back the very next day, and she could already feel them pushing against the toe of her shoe. Not for a second could she forget what she was. Even on the eco-reserve, when her only focus was staying alive, she was aware of how different she was. Every whiff of sleeping gas, every splash of acid in her face, every time she jumped high or kicked with her claws, these things were all part of her now, at least for the time being. And if she was honest with herself, she kind of liked it. She liked her unblemished face. Even more, she liked her new leg muscles, her speed, the sheer power of herself. She wasn't sure what awaited her, but right now, at this moment, she felt like she could handle it, especially if she didn't have to go through it alone. Petra and Seth would be keeping pace right beside her. The helicopter dipped out of sight behind the trees, and Anaya knew they were now spraying the fields on the eastern point. Dad had told her the plan. It was crucial the herbicide worked on all the cryptogenic plants, including the buried pit plants. Dad wanted to see if the herbicide would penetrate the soil to reach them. Nothing's happening, Petra said, staring at the wall of black grass. Give it time, Anaya replied, but she felt the same impatience. She wanted to see the grass wilt instantly. She wanted to see the vines writhe like they had when they touched the soil in her skin. But looking into the treetops, she couldn't see any frantic, snaky movement. We need this to work, Petra muttered. The whole world needs it to work, she added. Every day the news got worse. Crops were ruined, food shortages were becoming more common, and rationing had started in some countries. The death toll mounted and mounted. Despite all the emergency and military forces fighting the plants, tens of thousands of people were killed every day. Strangled gas melted. Nowhere was safe. This new herbicide was the world's best chance right now. And I looked across the field and at... Anaya looked across the field at all the other hopeful spectators. There was a group of Dr. Weber's lab staff, and there was Carlene Lee with a bunch of soldiers. And I had seen her talking quite a bit with one soldier in particular, and it made her nervous. She hoped Carlene was keeping her mouth shut. And farther along the field was Colonel Pearson, binoculars to his face, with a bunch of other important-looking people, some of whom who had flown in today just for the test. Pearson lowered his field glasses and checked his watch. And I didn't think he looked pleased, but then again, when did he ever? The helicopter lifted back into view before heading home. It dipped low and strafed a huge raft of water lilies between the park and the base, using up the last of the herbicide. Anaya saw the chemical mist settling over the plants and the long flowered heads reared back taking aim but the helicopter was already out of range and coming into land. The moment it settled on the pad, Pearson and his, and his officers were walking toward it. With a clenched stomach, Anaya watched them talk to Dad and Dr. Weber. She couldn't hear a word they said, but she had a good idea that Colonel Pearson was asking why it was taking so long, which was crazy because most herbicides took at least 24 hours to start working. She knew Dad would be reminded 
would be reminding him of this, and Dr. Weber would be backing him up and telling the officers they needed to be patient, and this was a first try after all. But Anaya couldn't help feeling a creeping disappointment and dread as she looked back at the water lilies and the vine-choked trees and the vast, unbowed wall of black grass. None of it looked one, big, one bit different. The curry that Anaya's mum had made was delicious, but Petra didn't have much of an appetite. In the living room of the little apartment, everyone was sitting with plates balanced on their laps, eating and talking. It may just be a question of the concentration, Mr. Riggs was saying. Maybe it's not potent enough for a big spray. It could also be the medium we're using to deliver it, Dr. Weber said. It might be antagonistic to the bacteria. We probably rushed the lab tests. I know we rushed them. Petra could tell everyone was as bummed out as her, even though the grown-ups were trying to sound all positive and saying it was ridiculous to jump to any conclusions before 24 hours had passed. Words like enzymes and titration and stabilizing agents were bounced around. All she knew was that eight hours after the spray, the cryptogenic plants looked just as healthy as ever. You're not the only ones working on this though, right? Her father asked. No, Mr. Riggs replied. We sent soil samples and our data to 10 other government labs around the world. If we don't nail it, someone else will, Dr. Weber added. But Petra wondered if she was really as confident as she sounded. We need to get back to Salt Spring, Mom said. What? Petra turned immediately to Seth and Anaya and was glad they looked as startled as she felt. But we're safe here. You said things were terrible over there. That's exactly why we need to get back, her father told her. They need me at the hospital, and the RCMP needs your mother. Petra felt her cheeks heat in embarrassment. Of course her parents were needed over there, and part of her wanted to go home too, but she also wanted to stay here, not because it was safer. The idea of being separated from Anaya and Seth gave her a terrible pang, and, it wasn't, and wasn't it better to be closer to Dr. Weber, who knew better than anyone what might happen to their hybrid bodies? I think Petra's also concerned she might be noticed, Dr. Weber said, and Petra nodded gratefully. Yeah, what if my tail keeps growing, she told her parents, and my body keeps, you know, changing. If the tail becomes an issue, Dad began, and Petra wondered if tail was a word, hard word for him to say, I can get one of the surgeons at the island hospital to take care of it. It would be a risk, Dr. Weber said. People would talk. One of the news outlets gets hold of it, and we're in a mess. I'd rather bring in one of my own people and have it removed in secrecy, she looked at Petra, if that's what you want. Of course it's what I want. There might also be other health issues that arise, said Dr. Weber delicately, and I'd rather she were here so I could take care of her. We should stick together, said blurted out, the three of us. He sounded so sincere, and Petra felt touched. She wished she could tell him she felt the same, but when her eyes flitted to her father, he was giving Seth a strange look. As for her mother, she regarded Dr. Weber with her cold police gaze. Petra knew she'd had a lot to accept in the past few days, and it was probably hard to like the person who told you that cryptogens had abducted you, implanted their DNA inside you, and oh, that your daughter was only half human, without any of your husband's DNA. She wondered if mum could even really believe it all yet. I'm not sure I've got a clear picture of what we can expect, mum said now, looking at Anaya's parents, in terms of next steps. Neither do I, Dr. Weber said frankly. We didn't finish the MRI scans, and I haven't had time to assess the ones we did, since we've been working out all out on the herbicide. The first step would be getting the three of them back in the MRI. Just thinking about what she might discover gave Petra's pulse a jolt. I don't want to change anymore, she said. I want to go back to normal, or as normal as she could be with a water allergy. But before they'd left the eco-reserve, Dr. Weber had taken a sample of the stinking lake water and promised she'd try to synthesize it. At least that way, Petra would have a supply of usable water her whole life. But first, she needed to go back to normal. We need to kill the plants first, right? She said to the doctor. Then we might stop changing. Dr. Weber said, Petra, even with all the plants gone, we don't know what will happen to the three of you. Well, that's not very helpful, Dad said. I know this must be incredibly hard, the doctor replied. I promise you, I will do my best for your children, but I do think keeping them here and their identities secret is crucial. On an army base, Anaya's mother said skeptically. Why are we assuming the army's reaction would be so negative anyway? Petra's own mother asked. 
Our kids are heroes. They did what professional soldiers couldn't. They rescued Mike, saved Dr. Weber's life, and got us the soil. If it works, they've saved the world. Where's the problem? Petra looked at mom startled. She just called her a hero, all of them. She couldn't help smiling. But there's already rumors on the base, and I said, remember what Jolie said on the island? People are talking about us. And she was terrified when she saw Seth's arms. She pulled a gun on us. I'm afraid that mo that might be the most people's reaction, Dr. Weber agreed, include including Colonel Pearson. You three share DNA with cryptogens that are trying to destroy the world. I agree, said Petra's dad. And frankly, I think our chances of keeping this secret are better on Salt Spring. All it takes is one soldier seeing Seth's feathers and our kids end up in military lockup. Petra turned to Seth, who was looking at his bulky sleeves self-consciously. You can't keep those hidden much longer, Seth, her father told him. You could probably take care of that right here. Seth looked over in confusion. What do you mean? Well, it would be fairly straightforward for Dr. Weber and me to remove them. With clippers, we could... I don't want them clipped, Seth said firmly. Seth, come on, said her father. You can't want to keep... Dad, Petra said. Seth was the only one here without parents, and he didn't need anyone giving him a hard time. Drop it. But he didn't. There's no point in keeping... Seth stood so suddenly that Petra gave a little gasp. No one is clipping my feathers. His eyes focused with a raptor's intensity, and his arms spread slightly. Petra thought they actually swelled, as if his feathers were straining against their bandages, ready to razor through. A prickle of unease traveled over her skin. She didn't know what to do about it. It's Seth's choice, Dr. Weber said calmly, and I promised I'd honor that. With relief, Petra saw Seth's shoulders relax. Limply, his arms fell to his sides, and he sat back down. Sorry, he mumbled but Petra could tell his father was shaken. CSIS is already looking, in, looking to move us to another facility, Dr. Weber said. We'll be more secure there. Where is it? asked Anaya's father. I don't know yet. We're not being separated from our daughter again, Anaya's mother said. I would make sure you could accompany them wherever we are. Dr. Weber's phone trilled and she looked at the screen. Excuse me, I need to take this, she said standing and walking into one of the bedrooms. I don't like this, Petra's mom said to Anaya's parents. I feel like we're losing control over our own kids. I think Dr. Weber is an honorable person, Mr. Riggs replied. Maybe, but everyone has someone in charge of them. She works for CSIS. What if she gets orders we don't like? I say we go home. Mom, said Petra, I'm not going home and turning into a friggin' croc crocodile. Her father gave a dismissive wave of his hand. You're going by some dream drawings, right? Look, this herbicide is going to work sooner or later. And once the plants disappear, life goes back to normal. She let out a deep breath. How she wanted to believe her father. Go home and have everything magically returned to the way it was. Well, said Mr. Riggs, I need to stay here until we get a workable herbicide. He looked at his wife and daughter. And I want you guys here with me. What about this talk of moving everyone to another facility? said Petra's mother. I'm not a fan. If it's the best way of keeping our kids safe and healthy, I think it's a good idea, Anaya's mother said, but I plan to be there. They stopped talking when Dr. Weber, Weber returned to the room, looking solemn. What is it? Petra asked. They found others, she said. Petra was so startled, she couldn't think of what to say. Kids like us, Seth asked, immune to plants? Dr. Weber nodded. Not just that. The boy they found in Halifax has claws on his hands and excessive hair growing on his legs. Petra looked at Anaya, who seemed barely to be breathing. And in Toronto, a girl was brought into a merge, and one of the nurses secretly took some footage on her phone. Do you have it? Seth asked. Petra crowded around with the others while Dr. Weber cued it on her phone. The footage was shaky, shot through a hospital dividing curtain. Petra saw a girl about their age in a hospital gown crying softly while two doctors examined her. The doctors kept blocking the view through the gaps. She caught a glimpse of an arm bristling with feathers. They were a different color than Seth's, but appeared just as sharp. Petra looked across at Seth, who watched the girl, mesmerized. She was pretty, and Petra felt an unexpected stab of jealousy. On the screen, the male doctor gave a cry and pulled back, blood dripping from his hand. Stay still. Another doctor told the girl, 
and the girl shouted back, get away from me. And then both doctors stepped back as she spread her arms threateningly. Nurse, the female doctor shouted over her shoulder, we need security. Then the video image went sideways and cut out. What happened to her, Seth, Seth, Seth asked, frowning with concern. Is she okay? Apparently they sedated her. My colleagues in the States also just reported several teenagers with exactly the same profiles as you three. So the secret's out, Petra asked urgently. So far, we've managed to contain it, Dr. Weber said, but it won't be long before it leaks. This changes things. We may need to move you all quicker than I thought. Pause. Petra locked eyes with Anaya, then Seth. They weren't alone. Dr. Weber had already told them about her own son and guessed there must be others out there in the world, but it was different now, knowing. They weren't solitary freaks. There were kids the same age with the same feathers and claws and hair and skin and tails, the same ability to jump high or slash, slash things apart or swim underwater. You are right, she said to Anaya. We must be part of some big experiment. We're lab rats. And yet she felt strangely reassured. They weren't alone. Failed lab rats, Anaya said, looking at her parents. So they sent down plants and we started to do better. Petra suppressed a shiver. To see if they can come themselves? Okay, slow down, said her dad. There's an awful lot of guesswork here. If you guys were supposed to be specimens, who's been studying you? Where have the cryptogens been all this time? Well, they must have been here at some point, Anaya, Anaya's mother said, then added with difficulty, the night the children were conceived. So have they been hiding out on the planet all these years, watching us? Seth asked. The idea was almost too creepy for Petra to fathom. Night faces at her window, looking over her as she slept, examining her in her sleep. It doesn't make sense, Mr. Riggs said. If the planet was truly hostile to them, they couldn't have survived here for any length of time. Maybe they wore suits, Petra said, or sent robots, or they've been watching us from a spaceship. I don't know. They must be able to do all sorts of stuff we can't. Anyway, if we wipe out all the, their plants, they'll give up on Earth, right? This was her grand hope, and she didn't want anyone chipping away at it. Maybe so, Mr. Riggs said. Farmers without a crop don't last long. Let's hope tomorrow we can see some damage to those plants. Seth woke from a flying dream, heart pounding in his temples. He'd been soaring so quickly, it was almost like being pulled, as if someone was expecting him and was eager for his arrival. He wasn't high in the sky this time, but skimming low over land, because it was misty on all sides. He looked over his right shoulder at his splendid wing, the feathers glinting almost metallically in the sunlight, and there was Anaya, furred and sleek and bounding alongside him. Over his left wing, keeping pace through the water, was Petra, light glistening off her flanks, fierce but graceful in the water. What joy he felt to be with both of them, and all traveling in the same direction, all heading, headed somewhere momentous. And then his attention was focused forward, straining to see what awaited them. When he woke, his chest was damp with sweat, and his arms ached as if he'd been truly beating them up. Sitting up, he rubbed his temples and then put on his clothes. He could tell by the curtains the sun hadn't risen yet, but he felt awake and restless. He slipped out of his room and left the apartment he'd been sharing with Carlene since Petra and Anaya's parents had arrived. He knew this his way around the building by now, down a long windowless corridor, hang a right, then he was at the doors. Outside, it was overcast, and the air still had a cool bite to it which would have been refreshing if it weren't for the sulfurous stench given off by all the water lilies in the harbor. He'd overheard Dr. Weber and Anaya's father mention that the plants were emanating methane and how that could eventually change the planet's atmosphere, warming it, altering its chemical composition, making it ready for them. The sky was brightening in the east, but it would be at least half an hour before the sun broke the horizon. He nodded at a mask at a masked soldier on patrol near the parking lot and headed toward the east field. Petra was standing near the high chain link fence, looking across the water at the black grass in Stanley Park. He was happy, but somehow not surprised to see her. Any change, he said quietly, walking up beside her. Don't think so, she said, as if they'd already been talking for a while. 
The dream made him feel incredibly close to her, like they'd shared an amazing experience. He wanted to enjoy the feeling before telling her about his dream, or maybe he wouldn't. He should probably keep his dreams to himself. The last time he'd shared them, she got really angry. I thought I heard some vines cracking earlier, Petra said, but it was just a bird getting eaten. Hey, said a voice behind them, and Seth turned to see Anaya walking toward them. Hey, Seth said back, and now felt the full strangeness of it, all three of them being in the same place at the same moment, as if by agreement. Couldn't sleep either, Petra asked. Dream woke me up, Anaya said. It was so vivid. Seth knew the answer to the question, even before it left his mouth. Were you running? Startled, she looked at him. He had his answer. Not just running, Petra said. You were taking these huge leaps. Yes, Anaya breathed. And you were swimming. You were so fast. Petra turned to him. And you were between us, flying. He nodded. His skin prickled in the cool air. He remembered when he'd first seen both of them in his dreams. Never did he think one day he'd see, they'd see him in theirs. How could we all have the same dream, Anaya said. Did I have scales, Petra asked. No, Seth said to her. Oh, good, breathed Petra. I didn't see any either. I was covered in hair, Anaya said. Petra touched the back of her head and asked, Did you guys get the headache? Seth nodded. Anaya said, And we were going somewhere. Where, though? This is so weird, Petra said, her pale face in the coming dawn. Is it? Seth asked. We've been having the same kind of dreams all our lives, only now we're in them together. I don't want this, Petra said abruptly, and Seth worried for a moment she was going to freak out. I just want to be normal. Gently, he asked, you sure? Of course I'm sure. What are you talking about? What about the swimming? Shut up, Seth. In the lake, he said quietly, you loved the swimming. Her face softened and became wistful. I did love it. It was amazing. I felt like I was in exactly the right place. But it was also like I was, com was a completely different person. She shook her head as if trying to dislodge a nasty thought. So yeah, the swimming was great, but there's a lot of stuff like getting a tail and my skin sloughing off, turning into one of them. I want wings, Seth said. I want to fly. Had he ever said it, so simply and bluntly? He felt his feathers taped against his skin and felt proud of them, their dazzling color, their sharpness. They let him do all sorts of things. You really think you could fly? Anaya asked him. If my feathers keep growing, maybe. He watched their faces closely and was relieved there was no revulsion in them. That would be amazing, Petra said. He let out a breath. He'd been so afraid they'd think he was a freak. So no, I don't want to go back to normal, he said. And I kicked the ground. Normal. For me, that means a snotty, zitty mess. I was not enjoying being feeble. You're enjoying being pretty, too, Petra said wryly. Seth saw Anaya's face redden. Okay, fair, she said, but I'm also growing fur and claws, so I can probably say goodbye to that one. We'll always be us, Petra told her kindly, and Anaya returned the smile. Look, Seth said, pointing. Along the edge of Stanley Park, some of the massive stalks of black grass had yellowed. With a snap, one of the stalks cracked and fell. Quickly, followed by a second. It's working, said Anaya. Yes, shouted Petra. Yes, yes, yes. Seth had never believed people really jumped for joy, but he did now. Call the colonel, Anaya shouted at the soldier across the field. Call everyone, it's working. Within minutes, people were hurrying out of buildings, soldiers of all ranks, Colonel Pearson still buttoning his jacket, Dr. Weber pulling a sweater over his tussled head. Across the water, the wall of black grass was turning the color of curdled milk. Amid the darkness of the mighty firs and cedars, jagged, jagged streaks of yellow started to appear. It was the vines withering and snapping as they fell through the branches. Seth turned to see Anaya's and Petra's parents rushing toward them. He watched them hug and felt the old familiar clench of loneliness. The girls had their families and sooner or later they would go home without him. Even if he got wings, it would, even if he got his wings, would it make up for losing his friends? Look at that, Mr. Riggs said as more black grass cracked and fell under its own weight. It's coming down. Under 20 hours and it's coming down. 
Cheers went up from the soldiers. From the city, Seth heard shouts carry across the water. On rooftops and balconies, even on the streets, people had been watching and waiting and hoping for this moment. A news helicopter buzzed overhead and started filming. Car horns were honking downtown. From a rooftop, someone sent up a fountain of fireworks. Their lights fluttered down like a dozen shooting stars whose wishes had come true. The water lilies too, Dr. Weber shouted, coming over to them. Look! The bat-shaped leaves were turning a sickly green, and their seed-spitting heads drooped into the water. Colonel Pearson marched over and shook, his, shook hands with Mr. Riggs and Dr. Weber. You make this stuff work a little bit faster, and I can load my soldiers up with it, he said. He turned to Seth and Anaya and Petra. You're brave kids. You and your families are welcome to stay on the base as long as you would like. And he marched off, shouting orders to his deputies. We're going to win, Anaya said. We're going to get rid of this stuff. And maybe go back to normal, Petra added. Seth saw Carlene Lee out of the on the field with the soldiers, happily watching the plants die in Stanley Park. Before long, he knew she'd be filling out forms, trying to match him with new foster parents. Maybe Dr. Weber heard him sigh, because she put a hand on his shoulder. I wanted to talk to you about something. I asked Carlene if I could be your guardian for the time being. She said she'd be happy to do the paperwork. Seth looked at her, amazed. You're serious? Absolutely. So you'd be my foster mother? If that's all right with you. He suddenly couldn't speak. So just nodded, then nodded some more, happiness blooming through him. It started to rain, heavily all at once. Seth pulled up his hood. Beside him, Petra swore and ran for the base. But after a few steps, she stopped and turned back. Weird, she held out her bare hands. No itch. You see any rash? Seth looked at her skin and shook his head. Jubilantly, Petra tilted her face to the rain. Then her smile melted away. No, she muttered, gazing at the dark, pregnant clouds. And Seth suddenly understood. The last time rain like this had come, it came with seeds. These drops were so big, they seemed to bounce. They came down harder. After a second, he realized some of the raindrops weren't soaking into the ground. He frowned. They just rested there like tiny, clear eggs. Then, as he watched, the rain began to hatch. The end. Hatch, sequel, fall 2020, thrive, summer 2021.